Chapter 1 of Book 3 of Les Miserables, Volume 3, by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cagliostro. Les Miserables, Volume 3, by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book 3, The Grandfather and the Grandson. Chapter 1. An ancient salon. When Monsieur Gillenormand lived in the Rue Servandoni, he had frequented many very good and very aristocratic salons. Although a bourgeois, Mr. Gillenormand was received in society, as he had double measure of wit in the first place, that which was born with him, and secondly, that which was attributed to him. He was even sought out and made much of. He never went anywhere except in condition of being the chief person there. There are people who will have influence at any price, and who will have other people busy themselves over them. When they cannot be oracles, they turn wags. Monsieur Gillenormand was not of this nature. His domination in the royalist salons, which he frequented, cost his self-respect nothing. He was an oracle everywhere. It had happened to him to hold his own against Monsieur de Bonald and even against Monsieur Benji Puyvalet. About 1817, he invariably passed two afternoons a week in a house in his own neighbourhood, in the Rue Ferrou, with Madame la Baronne de T, a worthy and respectable person, whose husband had been ambassador of France to Berlin under Louis XVI. Baron de T, who during his lifetime had gone very passionately into ecstasies and magnetic visions, had died bankrupt, during the emigration, leaving, as his entire fortune, some very curious memoirs about Mesmer and his tub, in ten manuscript volumes, bound in red morocco and gilded on the edges. Madame de T. had not published the memoirs out of pride, and maintained herself on a meagre income, which had survived no one knew how. Madame de T. lived far from the court, a very mixed society, as she said in a noble isolation, proud and poor. A few friends assembled twice a week about her widowed hearth, and these constituted a purely royalist salon. They sipped tea there, and uttered groans or cries of horror at the sentry, the charter, the bonapartists, the prostitution of the blue ribbon, or the Jacobinism of Louis the Eighteenth, according as the wind veered towards elegy or ditherams, and they spoke in low tones of the hopes which were presented by Monsieur afterwards Charles X. The songs of the fish women in which Napoleon was called Nicola was received there with transports of joy. Duchesses, the most delicate and charming women in the world, went into ecstasies over couplets like the following, addressed to the Federates. Refoncez dans vos culottes le bout de chemise qui vous dépend. There, they amuse themselves with puns which were considered terrible, with innocent plays upon words which they supposed to be venomous, with quatrains with statistics even. Thus, upon the Dessault Ministry, a moderate cabinet of which Messieurs Descartes and de Serre were members. Pour affermir le trône ébranlé sur sa base, il faut changer de sol et de serre et de case. Or they drew up a list of the Chamber of Peers, an abominably Jacobin chamber, and from this list they combined alliances of names in such a manner as to form, for example, phrases like the following, Damas, Sabran, Gouvion Saint-Cyr. All this was done merrily, in that society they parodied the revolution. They used, I know not what desire, to give point to the same rough in inverse sense. They sang their little Saira. Ah, ça ira, ça ira, ça ira, les bonapartistes à la lanterne. Songs are like the guillotine, they chop away indifferently. Today this head, tomorrow that, it's only a variation. In the Fualdes affair, which belongs to this epoch, 1816, they took part of Bastide and Josion because Fualdes was a bonapartiste. They designated the liberals as friends and brothers, this constituted the most deadly insult. Like certain church towers, Madame de Tay's salon had two cocks. One of them was Monsieur Gillenormand, the other was Comte de la Motte-Valois. 
of whom it was whispered about with a sort of respect. Do you know, that is the lament of the affair of the necklace. These singular amnesties do occur at parties. Let us add the following. In the bourgeoisie, honoured situations decay through two easy relations. One must be where whom one admits, in the same way that there is a loss of caloric in the vicinity of those who are cold, there is a diminution of consideration in the approach of despised persons. The ancient society of the upper classes held themselves above this law, as above every other. Marigny, the brother of the Pompadour, had his entry with Monsieur le Prince de Soubise. In spite of? No, because. Dubarry, the godfather of the Vaubernier, was very welcome at the house of Monsieur le Maréchal de Richelieu. This society is Olympus. Mercury and the Prince of Guémené are at home there. A thief is admitted there, provided he be a god. The Comte de la Motte, who in 1815 was an old man seventy-five years of age, had nothing remarkable about him, except his silent and sententious air, his cold and angular face, his perfectly polished manners, his coat buttoned up to his cravat, and his long legs always crossed in the long flabby trousers of the hue of burnt sienna. His face was the same colour as his trousers. This Monsieur de la Motte was held in consideration in this salon on account of his celebrity and, strange to say, though true, because of his name of Valois. As for Gillenormand, his consideration was of absolutely first-rate quality. He had, in spite of his levity and without its interfering any way with his dignity, a certain manner about him which was imposing, dignified, honest and lofty, in a bourgeois fashion. And his great age added to it. One is not a century with impunity. The years finally produce around a head a venerable dishevelment. In addition to this, he set things which had the genuine sparkle of the old rock. Thus, when the king of Prussia, after having restored Louis the Eighteenth, came to pay the latter a visit under the name of the Count de Rupin, he was received by the descendant of Louis the Fourteenth, somewhat as though he had been the Marquis de Brandebourg, and with the most delicate impertinence, Monsieur Gillenormand approved. All kings who are not the king of France, said he, are provincial kings. One day, the following question was put and the following answer returned in his presence. To what was the editor of the Courrier Francais condemned? To be suspended. Such is superfluous, observed Monsieur Gillenormand. Remarks of this nature found a situation. At the Te Deum, on the anniversary of the return of the Bourbons, he said, on seeing Monsieur de Talleyrand pass by, there goes his excellency the evil one m gillenormand was always accompanied by his daughter the tall mademoiselle who was over forty and looked fifty and by a handsome little boy of seven years white rosy fresh with happy and trusting eyes who never appeared in that salon without hearing voices murmur around him how handsome he is what a pity poor child this child was the one of whom we dropped the word a while ago. He was called Poor Child, because he had for a father a brigand of the Loire. This brigand of the Loire was Monsieur Gillenormand's son-in-law, who has already been mentioned, and whom Monsieur Gillenormand called the disgrace of his family. End of Book 3, Chapter 1. Recording by Cagliostro.